I hope to do today is not only get you in the mindset of what conflict is all about, but bring some low and high power tactics, and we'll talk about what those terms mean, to you in your personal and professional space to make sure that you're ready to make a move when conflict does occur so that you can not only take better care of yourself, but you can take better care of the partner that you're engaged in conflict with. Conflict, whether we like it or not, is a part of our personal and professional lives. In our personal settings, we know what it looks like. In our professional settings, it can look very different. We can have conflict with our subordinates, conflict with our peers, conflict with our supervisors. And as we go through our professional days, they happen in different ways. We hear terms like passive aggressive. We hear terms like shunning. We hear terms like being cut out. Whatever it might be, that conflict shows up for you in different ways in your professional space. So what we'll do today is do a little bit of a walk around conflict. I'm going to ask you to build a little bit of your own takeaway as we go. And I'll walk you through that so that when you leave today, I'd like you to have just a small sticky note that you could leave this training with to put by your computer, maybe on your desk or on your monitor, right next to that webcam that we're all using every day. So make sure that you've got some things in your backpack, in your quiver to pull out and say, I'm ready to be a smarter uh, professional in the space of conflict. So while I'm doing some introductory comments here, if you've got a sticky note laying around your desk or maybe in that drawer you haven't opened in quite some time, just pull out a single sticky note. If you don't have a sticky note, even a scrap of paper would work. Something that you can just take a few little notes on today to make sure that we get something out of today's webinar and you've got an actionable way ahead. So let's talk a little bit about conflict while you look for that sticky note or, or piece of paper. Think about a time that you were involved in conflict. How did you handle it? How did you feel while you were in conflict? Try to kind of put yourself back there just for a moment. Maybe it was with a boss, maybe from a job that you already left, maybe from an engagement with the peer you had just yesterday. Maybe it's a portion of a meeting you were in a couple of years ago, and it's still with you, right? Right before you go to sleep, you remember it and you say, Oh, man, I should have said this, or I wish I had said that. Those moments of conflict. Let's just kind of put ourselves back there for a second. What were the circumstances of that conflict? What do you think the other person's point of view was? Were you satisfied with the outcome? What were the power dynamics? What was your title? Maybe the title of the other person. Were those different or the same? Reflect for a moment and kind of put yourself in the space of that conflict. As you put yourself into that space, I'd like to ask, why do we even care about conflict? What shows up for us as we consider what's at stake when we are in conflict with a boss, a peer, a subordinate? There's a couple ideas around why managing conflict in an organization is important. Conflict leaves its mark. It's a tax on an organization. I'd like to offer for a moment that when conflict happens, it taxes our organization in all areas. It taxes ourselves, right? We spend time thinking about it. We talk about that little idea of uh, I'm about to fall asleep and, oh, man, I just had this engagement that I should have said this or that. It affects us as an organization because it might be holding back a decision-making process. It might be holding us back from really saying some direct feedback to our boss that they need to get. Otherwise, things will go off track. It taxes our culture. It becomes a way of doing things here. Many of you might find yourselves now in professional spaces where conflict is a part of the culture, and you're saying, I'm not sure this is for me. And it seems to be almost unconscious from those around you, from the professionals around you. And then, of course, trust. A huge tax of conflict is trust. If we're in conflict with someone, that, that trust between us, between our peer, between our supervisor, between our subordinate, is tax. They're not sure if they're going to get more conflict from us or not when we engage the next time. So the reason we care about conflict is that it has huge implications. How we handle conflict is how we are perceived as leaders. It's too often that the good things we do as leaders, 
And for those of you on this call who might be leading others, leading leaders, or even leading entire organizations or institutions, you know that when things go really well, you feel good, but you might not get all the credit. But when things turn to conflict, all eyes are upon you. And we're reminded of the, the idea from Maya Angelou that says people don't remember what you've done for them, but people will remember how you made them feel. So today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how to make people engage in conflict in a very healthy way and make sure that you have got high and low power tactics to make people feel good. Yes, I said it, good about the conflict that you're having. So when conflict goes right, what does it look like when conflict goes right? Increased creativity and innovation, reframed ways at looking at old problems, building trust within the team. These are opportunities, not necessarily spaces where we, that we have to be afraid of or spaces we need to avoid. But when conflict goes right, we come to a better solution. I'd encourage you all to look for uh, a book called Polarities a book that will take our discussion today a little bit further that discusses deeply what it looks like to weave two ideas together to create a compromise solutions, which to all of us on this call, you'd say, I know how to compromise. I, I've done it a million times. I encourage you to take a look at polarities that really talks about the questions that need to be used, the questions that need to be asked to take a look at conflict and say, what if we made more here? What if idea A and idea B is not a binary choice, but to create a choice C where both are possible, to build trust within that team, to reframe the way we look at old problems and create a safe environment with empowerment to take risks. As we go through our presentation today, there are a couple of items I've put in green in our slides and I'd like to just highlight those as we go through as kind of key takeaways in each section of our presentation. So I'll just read this out loud as you read it on the screen. That's right, it's poor reputation under the right circumstances. Conflict can be functional and positive. When it goes well, the people involved tend to feel satisfied, can learn or innovate, and may even grow closer as a consequence. So as leaders, again, whether that's leading yourself, leading others, leaders or institutions, Think of conflict as an opportunity to create what is better, to grow closer as a consequence, to create idea C out of A and B, or idea, idea D out of ideas A, B, and C. Conflict is an opportunity, not a challenge. Let's talk about the other side of it, though, the side that you and I might be more familiar with, the side that is more instinctual to feel, We've got this primary or primal brain, right, that says conflict is bad. This is the fight or flight discussion that you've probably gotten in a uh, psychology one-on-one -on -one course at some point. When conflict goes wrong, what happens? Dominant voices are the ones heard, right? The loudest voice in the room, the deepest voice in the room, the boldest voice in the room. A lack of trust and psychological safety immediately pop up. Psychological safety, of course, being this idea that people feel comfortable offering their ideas and their entire self to a room. Psychological safety is a term that really developed just in the last few years, or I should say really have gone kind of mainstream in the last couple of years. And as managers and leaders on this call, I'd urge you to take a look, look into that concept. Again, this idea of feeling safe psychologically in the space you're working in. I can offer ideas without rebuttal. I can be inspired without the threat of being shut down. I can collaborate without the idea of competition. So a lack of trust and psychological safety are a result of conflict going wrong. Different and unique ideas are often silenced. I guarantee almost everyone on this call can point to a time where they say, yeah, I remember when uh, John brought up this new idea in a meeting and no one even said anything. We just kind of kept going. Unique ideas can be silenced when conflict goes wrong. A weak outcome. The group plays it safe. No one wants to stick their neck out, right? If conflict is a part of culture, we say, uh, you know what, I think I'll just, I think I'll just kind of let this pan out the way it's going to pan out. I'm not really interested today in 
sticking my neck out and taking one for the team. We don't want to be in this environment where we take one for the team. So as you reflect on your opportunity today, whether it's as at the individual or leader level, think about how you can create an environment to, to, to say it's okay to say something new here. It's okay to stick out your neck. And I, you might be thinking right now, Adam, the, the reason I'm here is I'm, I'm hoping you can tell me that. We're going to get there. But I want to get you in the mindset at the moment to say it's okay to create these environments to make sure that we know what happens when conflict goes wrong. Here's another green bullet at the bottom of our uh, slide five here. Conflict can also be destructive and isolating. When it goes poorly, people feel dissatisfied, frustrated, wronged, even become resentful or alienated. And I would assure you that everyone on this call, everyone today thinking, taking a moment out of their day to talk about conflict has felt this. You felt disenfranchised at some point, alienated, resentful dissatisfied when an idea of yours was not honored in the culture. And now this is not to say that all ideas need to come totally forward and be fully explored and discussed, but we want to create an environment with leaders at all levels that say, your ideas are welcome here. Your ideas can be honored here without the threat of conflict. Now I'm going to put you to work a little bit as we get into the, the how of um, conflict. I asked you before to take a little slip of paper or a sticky note out, and I'd like you to draw just a simple quad chart on it. I've got mine right here. I'll hold it up to my webcam. Very simple quad chart. And in the upper left, I'd like you to write me. In the upper right, my environment. In the lower left, tactics. And in the lower right, commitment. So just looking kind of clockwise there, me, my environment, commitment, and tactics. And this is going to be that sticky that we want to take away today. And before we go any further, as you make this quad chart, we're going to fill out that upper left quadrant. I'd like you to go back to that moment we discussed on the very first slide, what it feels like to be in conflict, and just notice for a moment what happens to you when you're in conflict. I'll share what happens to me I'm no exception, of course, to any of this, to give you some ideas. When I'm in conflict, I feel pretty hot. I actually get, like, physically hot. I think my face probably turns a little red. I begin to feel like I need to defend my position. I might feel a little anxious that others are about to attack me. There's some of that fight or flight happening. So this doesn't need to be long. This doesn't need to be three paragraphs. Just maybe five, six words, feel hot, anxious, challenged, or threatened. What are the words that come to mind when you think about you when conflict occurs? And I'll give you just 30 seconds to do that. In that upper left quadrant right under me, how do you feel when conflict happens? As you take the last 15 or 20 seconds to do that, I'll share that the reason we're doing this exercise today about you is to make sure that as we go through today's discussion, if you leave only with one idea, it's to know precisely how you feel when in conflict so you can notice it, that you can say to yourself, I am getting the sense, I am beginning to feel conflict here. If we don't know we're in conflict, we don't know when to apply the tactics to either alleviate the conflict or assess the conflict. Notice I, I did not use the word avoid. This, this is not about, this webinar is not about avoiding conflict. It's about managing conflict. So we want to be able to assess it and just note that it's happening. So just five more seconds on how you feel when in conflict. And we'll finish the rest of our quad chart as we go through today's presentation. So let's get down to the nitty gritty here. So behavior is a function of the interaction between personality and how one perceives his or her environment. We cannot understand human behavior unless we take into account both personality and context. And that was Kurt Lewin, uh, a German-American 
psychologist who spent a lot of time thinking about conflict and how people resolve it in. And I'll offer an equation here in green. So just make a note of our green, uh, our green notes today. Behavior is equal to a personality in the context of an environment. Uh, for many of you in IEEE, probably uh, of some rel uh, relative engineering background, we see that personality is a function of environment, right? So how we engage uh, in our, with, with our environment will be our behavior. So we're going to pull this equation apart a little bit and talk more about personality being, excuse me, behavior being personality and our environment together. So awareness is the first step. We talked about that. Once you have awareness, you are now in control. And our response is really based on two things, how you show up and the environment. Now, we cannot control our environment. I wish we could control how other people act. I, I wish I could control how my dog acts, okay? But we cannot control how other people act. But we can control how you and I show up. You and I can control how we approach, how we step in to spaces. We can control that, most typically. We usually can't control the environment. So approving our ability to navigate conflict is enhanced when we accurately perceive our environment we can assess what's happening around us with some relative accuracy and we can increase awareness of how we show up in conflict situations so we just did this first exercise in our quad chart i've got my little sticky note going here of me how do i feel when i show up in conflict what's showing up for me if i'm not aware of what's happening for me when i step into conflict I can't begin to make adjustments. I can't be, begin to assess what to do next. So awareness is our first step. So let's talk about appraising that environment, that first step and kind of being able to make adjustments into the conflict that we're in. There's a couple of questions that we consider when appraising the environment. What's the conflict intensity level? What am I getting myself into here? And notice that in the quad chart that I had you draw earlier, in the upper right, we've got that my environment box. Take a couple notes in here when we think about my environment. As we look at slide nine, what is the conflict intensity, uh, excuse me, inten intensity level? Is there a history between the parties? Is there a level of emotion on display here? Are we standing up and screaming in the conference room or on the Zoom call? Or is there some passive aggressive behavior happening? What level of intensity are we at? And what's the importance of the concerns or the issues? Many times as leaders, as leaders, it's our responsibility to step back and say, hang on everyone. This all started with an argument about what time Scott's birthday party should start. Let's reset and revisit the actual challenge that we're facing. What's the conflict structure? What are the objective goals? Is it a win-win? Is there an opportunity here for both to win? Where we use the word yes and, or the phrase yes and instead of no because. Challenge ourselves as leaders to, to not use things like, well, instead of that, we're do, we'll do this, or but your idea is X. We challenge ourselves to say both of these have value. What is possible in this space? What is the conflict transparency? How explicit is the conflict? Is it buried? Is it a personal issue between um, Adam and Jennifer? Or is it a professional issue that we can work out with some discussion, with some research, with some thought? Is it hidden under the surface? Before we move on, take a look at the questions I've offered, some of the concepts offered on slide nine and write down just one or two of them that you think kind of resonate with you and say, when I'm appraising my environment, I want to make sure that I check in on these things. As you look at these, the slide, you might say to yourself, you know what, that's something that I usually forget to do. I, I don't often think about, for example, what the actual problem started as or 
what the history might be between the parties. So as I fill out my sticky note today, I've already got me filled out, and now I'm looking at this upper right, the my environment space. Just one or two of those questions that kind of resonate with you is, you know what, that's something I need to be a little more aware of when I'm in the environment of conflict. Take just 20 seconds to write down a couple of those questions. Okay. As we move on, let's talk about Freddie Mercury. Just kidding. Let's talk a little bit about the greatest hits, a little bit about the ways that you respond in conflict. And when I talk about the ways you respond in conflict, what came to mind for me as I was, I was kind of putting my thoughts together for today's discussion, is that these are the greatest hits. These are the things that you go back to, the behaviors that you rely on to take care of you in these circumstances, right? If we went back to the, um, the, the cave person days, we would say, what do I do when I'm faced with a tiger? I grab my spear, I grab my shield. What do I do in conflict, my natural reaction? So let's think about your greatest hits for a moment. For most of us, our approach to conflict is automated, right? We get into conflict, we don't think about it. We just jump in with our usual stuff. And if you reflect for a moment, you might be able to say, you know what, Adam, if, I, if I'm being honest with you, I, uh, I might get a little defensive. I might raise my voice. I might begin to spout research or academic knowledge I have in the space. I might point someone to articles. I might get a little passive aggressive. I might lean back in my chair or my Zoom screen. We know the things that we do. So think about for a moment your greatest hits just kind of revisiting this idea of how you respond. We know, of course, where this is going. Our automatic approach, our traditional approach, our usual approach, of course, might not be what we need for the moment, what we call meet the moment in leadership coaching. It might not be what we need to meet the moment. So how do we do that? How do we become more aware and make some moves about how to meet the moment with greater efficacy when we're in conflict. And I'll offer a couple of ideas here around conflict and emotions and encourage you to uh, explore these further with the book you see on the screen. We'll talk about that in a second. So emotions rule the day in conflict, right? They are the things that are going to drive our behavior. Emotions profoundly influence how we view, uh, of course, uh, uh, situations and apprise different situations. And as they pool over time, this idea of like good feelings and bad feelings, they pool up, they create these emotional reservoirs and relationships that either can buffer us in difficult times, right? Let's think about a great relationship you have with a friend. You have a huge pool of positive emotions that you can pull from, even in difficult times where you may disagree about something. And it helps that degree, disagreement do what? Sort of dissipate, right? And move on. But if we have a pool of bad emotions and we get into conflict with someone, we begin to pull from that reservoir. And usually it's kind of like I'm, I'm pointing to my gut here, kind of pull from that and say something that I wouldn't ordinarily say, something that might be overly aggressive, something that comes out in a very negative way, maybe even a personal way where we regret it later. And maybe all of us on this call would, would join me in saying that there have been times, right, where you, you lay down at night or you're, you're about to fall asleep, right, and you go, oh, man, I wish I had, I wish I had not said that. I might have been a little bit over the line. So as we think about what's possible in the emotional intelligence space, I'd encourage you all uh, to do a couple things. One, if you have the opportunity to take a short course or a short webinar on emotional intelligence, please join it. In absence of that, this is a very inexpensive book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Uh, pick it up anywhere. You can get it at every airport kiosk. You can get it uh, on Amazon for about $12.95 on most days. I encourage you to purchase it, and there's two things in this book. One, it's just a great read that sets up the structure of emotional intelligence and its four key components that have to do with how I am personally and how I am socially with emotional intelligence. But maybe most importantly, it gives you a very simple uh, assessment. Uh, it gives you, if you buy the book, it gives you a little code in the back 
You can take that assessment to get a sense of kind of where you are in the emotional intelligence domain. For lack of a better term, it kind of gives you an emotional IQ score that you can gauge on the areas you need to work. How self-aware am I? How socially aware am I is the bottom line. So as we take a look at emotional intelligence, I encourage you to look at that as a way to explore things a little bit further in the emotional intelligence domain. Let's think about what happens when we're in that moment of conflict. We've now assessed the situation. We've used our emotional intelligence. And I realize they're moving through some of these larger topics pretty quickly. But we've used our emotional intelligence to assess the situation, appreciate what's happening. We've now asked ourselves a couple questions that maybe we wouldn't have before today's conversation about who's in the room, what are the power dynamics, so on and so forth. And here's what we want to do. Here's the shift we want to make in the conversation of conflict from high intensity to low intensity, from competitive to cooperative, from covert to overt. If any of these resonate with you from left to right, jot them down in that up that, excuse me, that lower left quadrant around tactics. We're going to get specific about some tactics you can use here in a minute, but I'd like you to zero in on just one of these that feels like, yeah, that's that's what I really would like to do as a manager, as a leader, as an individual. I want to lower the intensity. I'd like to make things more cooperative versus competitive, or I'd, I'd like to make things more overt instead of covert. And these words that you see here are not by accident. They are um, they're tempting different uh, different types of personalities, right? Some of us just want to kind of reduce the temperature in the room, high intensity, low intensity. Some of us would say, well, if I'm overt, that's going to increase the temperature. But some personalities would say, let's put this all on the table. Let's, let's just talk about it, right? And instead of being covert and passive, let's make this more overt. And, of course, some personalities would say, I want to avoid the competitive and get cooperative. That's a, a productive personality that I'm speaking to now, someone that says, Look, no matter what, friends, we've got to get this product out the door. We've got to get this piece of software developed, this piece of hardware developed. So we need to stop the competition and get focused on cooperation. Let's move into some specifics around tactics, and we'll get focused on that lower left of our quadrant. We now have an appreciation in the upper left of how you feel. In the upper right, we've got a couple of questions to remind yourself about how to, how to assess or appraise that conflict environment a little more articulately. And in the lower left, tactics. We're going to talk low power and high power. Now, what's the distinction? A low power tactic is something you might use if you're not very comfortable kind of stepping into the space aggressively and making sure that conflict is squished, right? So let me make a, an analogy here to help you. If um, conflict is a fire we're trying to put out, uh, a low power tactic would be the garden hose, a light spray with the garden hose to try to cool things off a little bit. High power tactic, we're coming in with one of those great airplanes that dump all that red powder. And I wish I knew something about the analogy I'm trying to make, but they drop that fire retardant right from the 737. And uh, we see them on the news doing these, all these sort of heroic things. That's the high power tactic against that wildfire of conflict. Let's talk about a few of the low power things we can do. And as we talk about these, I want you to write down in that lower left one, lower, that lower left quadrant, something that really resonates with you, something that says, you know what, I could try that. Let me see if I can remind myself to try that. Even if you're like, yeah, of course, Adam, uh, everyone knows not to focus on the problem, focus on solutions. But if you don't find yourself doing it regularly, write it down in this lower left tactic. Because remember, again, keep the sticky note on the bottom of your, your computer screen to remind you that this is a way forward in conflict. So let's talk through this a little bit. Tactics, low power, reframe a more positive outlook, right? And that's what could be for you and for your group to say, I see that there's conflict happening in this space. That's okay. Let's find where we're going. Let's realize that this is a part of the process. We might all recall from that Psych 101 course that we took this idea of storming, norming, performing, right, the, the stages that a group goes through. This conflict often happens in that storming stage where people are getting to know each other and competing ideas and 
making sure that they've got some um, respect or honor within the group. Present problems as ours rather than yours, right? So it's not your problem that the software is wrong. It's our problem that we're struggling to move forward with this. Don't bring one problem, bring several solutions. So instead of focusing on, boy, we are mired in problems, reframe to we are mired in the potential to create solutions here. This is not an opportunity to leverage a leader's weakness. Now, this one's a little bit, a little bit unique, and let's spend a, a, a minute on this to make sure we really understand it. Not an opportunity to leverage a leader's weakness. As leaders ourselves or individuals within an organization, we never want to use conflict as an opportunity to highlight a leader's weakness, especially in public. And we'll talk about effective feedback in a few slides. But in this moment, when we're thinking about when we're thinking about leveraging a leader's weaknesses, we want to stay away from this opportunity, stay away from this idea of saying, "Look, you know, obviously." Uh, Bob, let's call him Bob, our, our uh, dear boss in our imaginary scenario. Obviously, Bob has done it wrong again. He's brought us again to this place of conflict. We can't see our way out of this. Let's not use conflict. Let's agree in this group today. Let's not use conflict to leverage a leader's weakness to build ourselves up. And the last year, is a very clear tactic and one that I'd like to encourage you all to write down if it's not something you do regularly, to ask open questions to create space and opportunity. Asking open questions would start with only two words, either what or how, create space for a respondent and they create opportunity. If we use the word why, it passes judgment. If we use the words like is or does, it forces our listener or our, uh, our respondent into a closed space. Now I've got to say yes or no. So the distinction would be, Adam, why did you wear that shirt today? I immediately feel judged. I feel like, oh, wait a second, do you, do you not like my shirt? Do you, what? Another example of a closed question would be, do you like that shirt? Now I'm forced into a yes or no. Is that the shirt you wanted to wear today? Judgment and a closed question. Now I've got to say yes or no. But what if we use an open question? Adam, how do you like that shirt? I really like it. Thanks for asking about that. I like the stripes. I like the collar. It's got nice buttons on it. It's very comfortable. Thanks for asking about that. What do you like about that shirt? Oh, I like the fact that it's got sleeves. I can roll up. It's cool in the summer, warm in the winter. If we use what and how, it gives space and creates space for our respondent. So if we, spot, if we find ourselves in conflict, a low power tactic that no one in the room will notice will be to use what and how questions for the person that's struggling most with that conflict. Let's think a little bit more about high power tactics. Here comes that 747 or that 737 with the giant plume of fire retardant. Expanding the power pie, inviting more people into the space to create more ideas. So physically, I'm thinking about who else do we need to bring into this conversation to alleviate the conflict, build up the emotional bank account. This high power tactic is one to be used over the long term where I might say, let's build a stronger relationship outside of this conflict. So we have a reservoir, a positive reservoir to pull from that I mentioned earlier. Trust the team to take charge. As a leader, could we step back in a moment and say, you all decide. A brave move for a leader to say, I'm actually gonna step back from this conflict and let you assess where you are and what you'd like to do next. Don't take yes for an easy answer. We have probably all found ourselves in different circumstances where we say, Look, can we all just agree to do, you know, idea B and move ahead? And what do we get from the group who's exhausted from conflict? Yeah, sure, fine. Let's just do it. That only adds to that negative reservoir. Make sure we reach conflict resolution. And a high power tactic to do that is to say, you know what? We're not taking the easy yes for an answer here. Let go of control and the need to be right. 
This is a tough move for a lot of leaders. Let go of the idea that you need to be the final say. Let go of the need that you or your space is the correct one. And if we think of ourselves as not just the leader in the room, but as the one offering the most conflict or the most controversial idea, what if we could let go and say, this one, this battle isn't worth it. Let someone else have the light for the moment. Create a culture of cooperation through open questions that we've talked about before and professional patience. Let's talk for a moment about what professional patience is. It's a, 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 a term that I've coined in a couple different articles. And professional patience is this idea that at different times, we're willing to step back and say, I will wait. I will wait to see how this evolves. I will wait to see how this pans out. I'm willing to wait for this conflict to heal itself, to make progress against the issue. Let's just talk a little bit about some of the benefits of conflict adaptivity. Higher levels of adaptivity mean we can be more satisfied with the conflict, that conflicts in our professional and personal space can actually come and go with great ease. There's a little bit of conflict there, but there's no big deal, and it left. Some of us on this call might still be in the space where conflict feels heavy, like a large concrete wall in front of us, something that we've got to deal with immediately, something that is like, all stop, there's a conflict here. What I'd like to, or to invite everyone to do on this call today is to say, conflict is like the tide. It comes and it goes. It will arise, and as leaders, we see it, we assess it, we manage it, and it goes back into the sea. And here it comes again, a little bit of conflict. Conflict is the natural product of collaboration, the natural product of working together with other people. We create more emotional well-being in that space, right? We talked about psychological safety before, this idea that there are opportunities to create social, excuse me, psychological safety out of conflict. We've got more satisfaction with our coworkers. Yes, Scott and I butt heads often, but you know what? We end up with a better result because we talk about it. We bring our adult voices to the room. We bring our whole self to the room, offer what is most important to us, offer our position, and are willing to collaborate about what's possible. Higher levels of adaptivity lead to less stress, and they lead, of course, and this is uh, not anecdotal, but uh, very much so uh, quantitative, less intention to quit one's job. If we move into a space of professional conflict, I guess is that everyone on this call would agree. We'd say, I might need to look for a new opportunity soon. I might need to look for a new job. I am not in the business of seeking conflict. Satisfaction with our degree of innovative thinking, new insights and creativity and other subordinates as a function of that, that psychological safety I, met, I, I mentioned earlier, right? I want to spend a little bit of time, and we've got uh, just about four minutes or so before we switch to our Q&A portion, and I'm grateful for all of you for kind of sticking with me through this. I'd like to spend four minutes on this idea of effective feedback because as I've gone through hundreds of leadership coaching sessions with hundreds of different leaders, um, giving feedback to people is a place that a lot of conflict arises. Because when we give feedback to someone, positive, that's the easy stuff. But when we need to give construction, con excuse me, constructive criticism, conflict can arise because that fight or flight takes over, right? Adam says, wait a second, my presentation skills are good. My presentation skills are top notch. I don't, I don't, I can't believe you're telling me this. I don't need to hear it. And I become defensive. So I want to talk about a concept called radical candor for a moment. Radical candor is a model for feedback that emerged in just the last five years. And it was developed by a woman named Kim Scott, uh, who has worked for places like Facebook and Google. And she created a quadrant here that walks us through what it means to give radically candid feedback. I'll walk you through the matrix and then talk a little bit about what some examples might sound like in radical candor. And again, the reason we're doing this, I realize that giving feedback feels like a little bit of a, an offshoot or a branch of a conversation around making conflict work. 
But effective feedback, again, is one of those areas, or giving feedback is one of those areas that a lot of conflict arises. So the radical candor model for effective feedback. When we think about giving feedback, we want to do two things. We want to challenge a person directly and also care personally, right? So we challenge and we care at the same time. What this quadrant does for us on the left-hand side of our screen is it breaks down for us what happens when we do both or when we're missing one or the other or when we're missing both. So when we care personally and challenge directly, that's called radical candor. It means that we've told the person why we are honoring them with this feedback, but we also give them direct feedback around what needs to be improved. If we look in the lower left, manipulative insincerity, this is a space where we don't care and we don't challenge. So this would be a good example of this, and I'm going to join you and say, I might have done this sometimes. Let's say you attend a webinar, not today's, that is so terrible. It's so absolutely awful and not worth your time. You get a survey feedback form and you say, you know what, it was so terrible, I'm not even going to fill out the feedback survey. We have now taken the opportunity to not care about what was offered to us and not challenge the person who delivered it. We have failed to care and failed to challenge. We've now moved into the space of what's called, in this model, manipulative insincerity. Look, just, just do your webinar again. I'm not going to be a part of it. You'll, you won't waste more of my time. Go waste someone else's time with that, right? Manipulative insincerity is the worst case. We have failed to care and we have failed to challenge. Let's talk a little bit about what is second best to radical candor, the thing that doesn't feel good at all, but at least still carries the message. It's when we challenge directly but fail to care. And all of us can probably come up with a name that we wouldn't want to say in a public webinar for people that challenge us directly, but we don't feel like they care about us at all. They only give us the negative feedback. It might sound something like, Adam, that was a terrible webinar, and they just walk away. Or, Adam, your presentation skills, oh, boy, you're way off the mark, and they just walk away. They've challenged me with feedback, but they didn't care at all. They didn't mix the two. And so we call that person a jerk, right? They're a meanie or some other word that all of us might agree on. We know these people. We've met them. We've met the people that practice obnoxious aggression. They give challenge without care. Let's look in the upper left-hand corner now as we kind of wrap up and move towards Q&A. We have folks that care personally so much that they fail to challenge directly, and that's called ruinous empathy. Ruinous empathy is when we go, Adam, that was a phenomenal webinar. No notes, no feedback. Couldn't have been better. It was right on. You're so great. Keep going. And what does this do? It might encourage poor behavior to continue. It doesn't allow that person any opportunity to improve. So remember, if you think you're being kind to someone by saying like, hey, great job, no feedback, really super, we haven't challenged them at all. So I'd offer you, again, to, to push you towards that upper right corner of this model to radical candor, where we care personally and challenge directly. It might sound something like this. Adam, that was a great webinar. I appreciate the information you offered. It sounded really good. One thing that's holding you back is that you say um and ah between every sentence. And I know it's holding back how brilliant you are when you deliver a presentation. And so what we've done there when giving radical candor is that the person offered why they care. They care about me. They want me to shine. They want me to be brilliant. They want me to come forward with my whole self. But they've also challenged me very directly. They said, you say I'm in awe after every sentence. And that is holding you back. At its core, radical candor is feedback that's both kind and clear specific and sincere. As all of you step into the space of, of giving feedback, one of those spaces where we can fear conflict at its greatest moment, we can step in and care and challenge at the same time. 
challenge yourself to do that. Before we move to questions, I'd like to offer one last thing. You'll notice on your quadrant, you've now filled out me, which is how I feel in conflict. You've filled out my environment, the things, those questions you're going to ask yourself to remind yourself about what I should be checking out in this environment. You've maybe you've jotted down one or two low and high powered tactics about how you can handle yourself. I'd encourage all of you to write down that one about using open questions, the what and how versus the is, does, and why. In this lower right quadrant, I'd like you to take just about 90 seconds, and we'll do this till about 50 past the hour. Write down a commitment to yourself about conflict. It might sound something like, I will do this the next time I'm in conflict. Or the next com time I'm in conflict, I commit to. The next time I'm in conflict, I will be sure to dot, dot, dot. Let's just take 90 seconds for you to fill out this last quadrant of our bring your own takeaway today, your commitments to conflict. And while you write that down, I think Scott and I will take a look at some of the questions that have come in and we can shift into that space. Does that sound good, Scott? That sounds great, Adam. That was a great uh, presentation. We have a few questions already um, sitting in the queue here for you. That's well, I mean, start right with the look. first one, or do you want to give them a couple more seconds? Uh, let's give them just a few more seconds, and I, I so appreciate it. We've got all sorts of great questions coming in, and uh, Scott, I'll let you kind of tease them out, and then I'll, I'll uh, be happy to respond to any of them. So. As folks finish those commitments, uh, what's a what's a good place to start, Scott? Um, I think here's a good one. Um, how do you how how can you tell if conflict is going in the direction in the right direction or the wrong direction? How do you sort of see it just sort of I guess percolating and can try to see which way it's going so we can avoid it going the wrong way. Yeah, really good question. So we're talking about kind of like, and I'm, I'm pulling out an imaginary antenna from my shoulder here, some of that emotional intelligence we mentioned to sense what's happening in the room. So I'd offer two things to this really great question. One, trust your gut. Your gut knows if conflict is going deeper or we're coming out of it. So put that antenna up and use that emotional intelligence. You have that sixth sense. We often talk about kind of those like, hairs on the back of your neck, uh, maybe as you're watching a scary movie, something like that, that's your gut. That's that sixth sense we want to use in those situations. The second is more practical. As someone who is assessing conflict in the room, we can qualitatively notice if parties are getting more staunch in their positions or if they're beginning to collaborate and find opportunities for reason. The biggest tip-off is that the two parties are beginning to use some of the same language when they talk about problems. That's a positive sign that things are moving forward. And the second positive sign is that the two parties are beginning to lower the intensity at the same energy level. And in practice, what this looks like is, imagine if uh, Wendy and Paul are having a conflict in a meeting, and Wendy is beginning to lighten her intensity but Paul's intensity continues to increase and become more serious and more staunch about his position, we don't have a productive environment happening. What we'd like to see is both of them begin to use similar language, and both of their temperatures rise sort of simultaneously. We see Wendy coming up a notch. We see Paul saying, you know what, I think I see a little bit more of your point here. And we start to see them kind of come up back to the surface after they've been sort of buried in the trenches of their own positions. So I hope that's helpful. Use that emotional intelligence antenna to just trust your gut on what's happening and begin to watch for similar language and how the two behaviors of the two parties are responding to one another. Are they both lightening? Are they both darkening? What else do you see in there, Scott? Um, how about what role does gen gender of the persons involved play in affecting the outcome of conflict? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and one that uh, we're obviously becoming more thoughtful about. 
in recent years and saying what's possible here as we uh, get into um, some of the more um, uh, more contemporary phrases that many of us have heard, like mansplaining, and uh, we, we move into male-female or female-female conflicts, I'd encourage you all, either as individuals or as leaders in your organization, um, to look at conflict not as a gender-based discussion, but as a, as a substantive discussion. It is most important in any conflict that we stay focused on what the challenge is. If we find ourselves mediating or facilitating or being a part of a conversation or a part of a conflict that where gender be- begins to play a more major role, it is most important to disengage at that point and say, let's step away, take a breath, so that you can get thoughts organized to come back in a more radically candid fashion. A radically candid gender statement might be like, Scott, I'm beginning to feel like this is becoming more personal. And I have to tell you that based off of the culture in our organization, I feel that because I'm a man or because I'm a woman, I feel this way or that way. So we can articulate I feel this because of our culture, and we can create a space where there's more psychological safety to bring those to the top. I know that many organizations, that would be hard to bring up, uh, but it's a first step in these circumstances. Scott, what else do you see? Here's one. Um, How do you handle a situation where you try to handle the conflict in a positive way and the other side is not responding? I'm sorry, Scott, you broke up for one second. Can you say that again? How do you handle a situation where you try to to push the conflict in a positive way, but the other side is not responding? I think I, I understand the question. So uh, if one is, is trying to make progress and the other one sort of stays staunch in their position, this is a huge opportunity for us to revisit the low power tactic of using open questions, right? This idea of saying, what else can we do to get you re-engaged in the conversation? How can we get you to re-engage in this conversation? What is possible if we bring your ideas to the table? When we see one party retreating, it's usually because they feel their ideas aren't being honored or aren't are being disenfranchised in some way. So we want to take that chance to use open questions to actually bring them back to the table to say, you know, as I reflect on this, Pam, um, I'll make up an, a, a quick conflict here. As I reflect on this, Pam, I'm noticing that the solution that is emerging does not include some of the great ideas you had about also bringing balloons to the party. In fact, as I look at the plan that's developing in our solution, there are no balloons at all. Pam, what do you think we can do to to bring in some of the balloon concepts to this party? And that invites their idea back to the table. There are times when we need to actually seed some ground to tease the interest of our distant party to come back to the table and say, what's possible here together? The danger of not doing that is building that bad reservoir, right? That, that sort of that spoiled milk reservoir of, If this doesn't get resolved, we will only find ourselves going back to this reservoir with more negative energy for the next, uh, in my example, party planning session. All right, great. Um, I'm going to combine these two questions. They were sent in separately, but I think they um, relate to each other. So the first question is, What is the best way to deal with an obnoxious aggressor? aggressor? And what is the best way to deal with microaggression? Yeah, great questions. And and you're right, uh, Scott. Thanks for combining those because microaggression is the tool of the obnoxious aggressor, right? So they, they will only challenge us. They will not care about us. And so what we want to do when we get only that obnoxious aggressor, I'm so glad that someone asked this because it is, it, it's two things. I'll share both things that are on my mind. One, it's the most common we see in the office space, especially in a supervisor-subordinate relationship, uh, especially perceived by the subordinate that um, 
well, to put a fine point on it to this to this group, uh, too often we hear, my boss is a jerk, right? And so we were perceiving our boss as an obnoxious aggressor. What do we do about it? As trained folks in making conflict work and in train, as, as trained uh, folks in, in radical candor, we reflect on the idea of bringing them back to the table to say, I need to understand more about the feedback you gave me about my presentation skills. He told me they were no good, but I didn't hear anything about what might be possible if they were better. Tell me what about my presentation skills will help me grow here. We want to actually do a little bit of managing up, even if it's to appear. I'll use the uh, subordinate leader example for, for this, but even if it's a peer, a little bit of management of their behavior to say, what else is possible here? So when we get into the microaggression behavior, it's so important to create it as a macroaggression, to, to go to the person and say, I have to tell you how I'm perceiving this. I feel this way about what's happening to bring it to the table. Even if the other person says, what are you talking about, Pam? I, I didn't mean that. We brought it to light. And my guess is that the person did know that. They're a little afraid of conflict. They're not as trained as you are now in making conflict work. They have no understanding of high and low power tactics. They've never considered radical candor. And so they find themselves in a position where you've now brought it to light and said, those emails, they're not, they're, they're unkind. They don't bring to light what's possible. They don't bring to light what is best. And I feel like we can create a more psychologically safe environment for us both. So to answer your question directly, what can I do about microaggressions? We want to actually ask open questions, bring that conflict to the surface to create them as macroaggressions and say, this is real, this is happening, and we will not stand for it in this environment. All right, excellent. Um, next question. Um, I, I really like this one. Most people form an opinion and then they do not budge from it. They filter data that does not align with their original view. How can a leader break through that human nature tendency? Yeah, really great question, Scott. And so I think what we're what we're leading towards there is confirmation bias, right? I like uh, that was actually the definition of it. So they filter information to confirm their own opinion, right? If I think all cups are red, I only see red cups. Uh, no cups are, could possibly ever be blue or yellow. If there are only red cups look how many red cups I have found, right? And so when we get into the business of confirmation bias and we have someone who is uh, staunch or steadfast in their opinions, we wanna make sure that we do everything we can to broaden their perspective and equally be, um, be proud and anchored in the fact that we are seeing a broader perspective. Remember, just because we're managing conflict doesn't mean we're avoiding it. And that can often be confused. It is okay to offer a firm opinion about what you believe based off of your value set, who you are, the qualitative and quantitative data you have access to. So if I had someone come to me and say, Adam, I've done the research, I've done the homework, there are only such things as red cups in the world, I would say, I hear you, I see you, Scott. But what's happening today is not aligned with the data that I have. And I would begin to show you, look at these yellow cups that I have, look at these yellow cups that I have, these other things that exist in the space to broaden the conversation. You might remember that one of the high power tactics that I'm referencing here is called increasing the power pie, making it a bigger horizon, a larger circle for the person to see instead of just their slice of the world or that single dot that says, you know, this is how much I know. They're willing to see the whole screen. Uh, what just occurred to me, and, and maybe this is appropriate for the environment we're in here in the computer society, is, is a person looking at a single pixel or are they seeing the entire monitor, right? Are they seeing the whole picture, a whole LCD screen of what's possible or just a single pixel of that? So use those open questions to broaden perspective when someone is offering confirmation bias. And it's also okay to use that language to say, look, I've, I've thought about this stuff, and I think what's happening is a little bit of confirmation bias here. 
We've got a lot of data to tell us that the whole world exists outside of this question. Scott, I know we're uh, a little bit over time, and, and um, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity for this and uh, to answer a few of these questions. So I'm um, grateful for everyone's attention today, and I hope that your, your sticky takeaway is something that you can put on your uh, computer or just next to your desk and will help you manage conflict as you go forward. All right, great. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, that was a really great uh, presentation, and uh, that was a really great uh, Q&A session as well. Um, one thing I do want to point out real quickly before we uh, truly wrap up here, um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is a monthly webinar. Um, Adam mentioned emotional intelligence. Um, if you've been to these before, Adam is one of our uh, speakers who regularly hosts a webinar, and he's actually hosting the webinar in August that is on emotional intelligence. Um, we normally will, I think, based since Adam mentioned this, we'll, we'll open up that registration and make sure you guys can start registering for that when you get the slides. Um, we might we might need a delay getting the slides out to you to Thursday instead of tomorrow on Wednesday. But we'll, we'll make sure that uh, registration link is in part of that form. Um, Adam, thanks again for being here today. And I want to thank all the attendees as well. Uh, you sent in a lot of great questions and made the end of the webinar and the Q&A session really engaging. Um, as mentioned, this is a series. The next webinar in July is titled Poor Pro Productivity Habits and How to Kill Them. That will be held on July 22nd. And as mentioned, Adam, I believe it's August 24th, will be doing the webinar on emotional intelligence. The Computer Society will be hosting a few other webinars in July. The first one will be on environments modeling-based requirements on July 15th. And the other one will be from the Smart Manufacturing Standards Committee on July 20th. We will, on July 29th, we'll be also hosting a webinar in Spanish um, on intelligent systems. You'll be registered for all these webinars and any of our up, other upcoming webinars with the link we provide in the email with the presentation and the recording of this webinar. Again, thank you for all attending. And Adam, thank you for sharing all your great knowledge. I think everyone was able to take away a great um, note and reminder that little quad um, chart you was, I think, is going to be really helpful to everyone. So thank you again, and have a great rest of your day. Great, Scott. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.